Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're focusing on three nonprofit organizations deeply, deeply invested in making sure that children have competent, effective teachers. We're going to be speaking with Kieran Jones, uh, Executive Director of Teach for America in Greater New Orleans, Peter Schulman, CEO of Urban Teachers in Baltimore, Maryland, and Kate Walsh, President of the Washington, D.C.-based National Council on Teacher Quality. So we we look at the public school uh, uh, system as a really valuable element of American society. Um, it is a place where uh, kids of all backgrounds and income levels can come together, get to know each other, interact, and then learn, learn from dedicated professionals. So could you just give us a sense of some of the challenges that you're confronting and some of the realities that, uh, that you're experiencing over in New Orleans uh, for Teach for America? I, I can. It's good to be here, Mark, with you all and, and um, my uh, my esteemed colleagues on this on this panel for this important discussion. Just a, a quick note: I was um, I was the ED, our, our executive director of our New Orleans region for about eleven years, um, from post Katrina un, until about twenty seventeen. I'm I now. Um, run multiple sites for Teach for America as part of our national organization, including um, parts of Louisiana, South Louisiana, especially. But I live in New Orleans, certainly, and I represent New Orleans on our state board of education, um, where we support, you know, this policy for 700,000 kids across the state and also um, support the work of our educators across New Orleans and the rest of our um, parishes. So um, it's through that lens that I'm, I get to be a part of this important discussion this morning. Um, look, I, I think... I, I'll, I'll kick us off and then I'm sure our colleagues have, have a lot more to say too. I, I would say, look, I think that the challenge we have that we face um, in our country, which existed before the pandemic, which continues to be true now, is we are still, um, we are still working to recruit um, our country's most imaginative future leaders to commit to, to starting careers in education, right? Um, you know, before the pandemic, our you know, numbers, not just um, for alternative or, you know, organiza certification organizations like Teach for America, leadership development organizations like Teach for America, but also even traditional pathways of education sort of faced um, real headwinds in terms of attracting this generation to the field. Um, and we are now in the middle of, of a time in our country where educators, arguably um, committed, imaginative educators are have never mattered more um, than they do right now. And, and we are not only um, faced with how to recruit them, how to sustain them, but also once they're in the classroom, especially given um, the challenges we face in New Orleans and across the country in light of this particular moment, um, we, we figure out, we have to figure out new ways of supporting them, um, supporting them to have skill sets that enable them to um, teach asynchronously, right? Um, not only connect with- Asynchronously, kids, you know. meaning that that you might have some kids in the classroom and you might have some kids online, right? Exactly. So you, and we, it's becoming a much more complicated environment, isn't it? It is, it is. And we, and our job is still to make sure that every teacher we put in front of a, a, a student or a set of students in a classroom are prepared, um, not only to, to, to teach content that's going to be meaningful and, and, and putting kids on a path to have a successful year, but also be able to build relationships and build trust and do all of that in a context now um, where some of the traditional teaching levers aren't, don't exist as they did before in the middle, of, and yet it's necessary. And Peter, in, in urban environments, you have particular uh, challenges, don't you? Yeah, so uh, urban teachers, we work in uh, Baltimore, D.C., and Dallas. And, you know, in, in prior works, district and policy, I've worked in in Miami and, and, and Camden and Trenton. And, you know, certainly, you know, it, it, it's it's. It, it's, it's a reality, Mark, um, as we think about the, you know, topography and tapestry of the United States. We can't divorce the challenges from our education system from those from broader society. So as we think about what this means for the um, for the content of this conversation, 
you know, there, there, there's a, a broader, I would say, disequilibrium in the labor market as we think about the production in terms of the quantity and quality of teachers that we need in this country. Kate had alluded to this earlier before we started the show in terms of, you know, the numbers and the volume of teachers that, that we uh, produce. Well, are we producing the teachers that um, in the subject areas and in the, the regions that most specifically urban and also rural students see? The answer is no. And, and we'll see that in terms of uh, what those jobs look like, in terms of what those jobs pay, in terms of where the incentives are for the teacher prep industry to produce teachers in, in what subject areas and doing student teaching in, in what locations. So in, in so many ways, as we think about the, um, the challenges of, of, of urban environments, specifically from the, the lens of a student, this is one more area where it is a more significant challenge. And this is where an organization like Urban Teachers, we try and step in with so many great partners like Teach for America and others out there that are really um, acutely focused on urban areas and specific challenges. And Kate, your organization is basically uh, dealing with teacher quality across the, across the country, not only in urban areas, but also in rural areas and the areas in between. If we take a look at states like, well, um, Arizona, where uh, Phoenix and, and Prescott are the are the population centers, or the Phoenix, Scotts, uh, Scottsdale, uh, uh, Tucson area, um, and then uh, Prescott. But then the rest of the state is is very dispersed. You take a look at at Oklahoma, you see the same kind of thing with the population center being around Tulsa, or in uh, Nevada, where you have uh, the Reno uh, Las Vegas uh, uh, connection. But then you have these huge uh, parts of the uh, of the state, rural areas where um, where just uh, attracting and, and keeping teachers is is a bit of a challenge. Could you give us a an America wide how how well do we as a country uh, serve our children regardless of their geography? Well, for starters, it, we don't even collect the data that would tell us what teachers we need and where we need them. Um, some states have put together uh, supply and demand databases, but um, amazingly, um, you know, teachers work across states, teachers move from around, and there's no national model that tells us where we need teachers. Now we know from many, many studies that rural teachers rural districts basically get the shaft. Um, they're educating 20% of America's kids. They're educating by far the poorest kids in this country. And we consistently um, have a difficult time attracting teachers to teach in those areas. But we shoot ourselves in the foot because we have all this talk about a national teaching shortage. And the responses to that are we need to raise pay across the board. Uh, we need to improve the environment in the classroom. None of those responses gets at the market problem that's at play, that we've got to figure out how to get a teacher who's currently working in Phoenix to go work out in the middle of nowhere. And to do that is going to require greater pay for teachers in rural areas than in a high urban area. That's just what's just the truth. The rural areas face 12 times the shortages uh, by one study, 12 times the shortages for every 100 teachers as urban schools. Yet much of our attention and I, I I'll take full blame for being too focused on the needs of urban schools and not enough on um, the dire straits that rural schools find themselves in. I love the sophistication of your point, because on the one hand, you're saying that um, we need to actually be able to act locally and find the right teacher for that particular circumstance and retain that, that teacher in that community. On the other hand, our pension for acting locally on the education side is an impediment to us collecting statistics on a national basis that would allow us all. Right? And I look at an organization like Teach for America, where you're, you're operating across the country That's right. and you're trying to figure out how to cultivate teachers and how to support teachers in a way. And you go back to Kate's point, which is, hey, you know, we don't even... We can't even get a rational picture that allows us to do any kind of pre-planning. Now, if you look at logistics, 
you know, if, if, if you ask McDonald's, where do you need hamburgers? If McDonald's is going to tell you. You ask Coke, where do you need a Coke? Coke is going to tell you. You ask mm-hmm. Facebook, where do you need more broadband access to our product? They'll be able to tell you. But teaching, we can't tell, answer that question. No. What's going on here? How, how, how do we deal with this? Well, we've been fighting about this issue for a while now. In fact, we're going to make our own effort to start a national supply and demand database because we can't persuade the federal government to do so. Um, You know, it's just enormously frustrating. And what it allows to happen is what's happened in the past several years. There was an article in the New York Times about five years ago that said there was a teacher shortage in, I believe, was six to eight districts. And that caught on like wildfire. All of a sudden, there was a national teacher shortage based on one reporter's coverage of eight districts. And we allow the media to declare a shortage and that feeds on itself. And nobody is operating from any set of real numbers. The truth of the matter is there is not a substantial teacher shortage in the United States in a lot of places right now. And yet you would not get that, you know, nobody seems to know that that's the case. People think a lot of teachers are quitting because of COVID and they aren't. But that doesn't mean we don't have real needs. Don't get me wrong. It just means that we are are only portraying them as a national problem and not as something that we have to really dig in at a local level and discuss and solve for. Now, there there are also issues, even within urban areas, about uh, cultural appropriateness. Um, when you have multilingual, you know, if you look at uh, Miami-Dade, you've got, um, what is it, a 71% uh, Latin Hispanic uh, population. You look at uh, Las Vegas, it's 46%. Uh, you look at uh, particularly areas uh, along the southern border where you have um, uh, families uh, that do not speak English uh, trying to support a child who is in an English-speaking um, educational environment. So you have the whole bilingual issue. Um, how do you um, uh, deal with with uh, these kinds of micro issues within urban and rural school districts so that the right skills um, are connecting to the right uh, uh, classrooms, Peter? So, so let me see if I can answer that question and tether back to the supply and demand at the same time. So as we think about these you know, broadly, nationally, philosophically, there's an imperative to act locally. And as we think about the work that Urban Teachers does and Teach for America, what we've said is we want to um, recruit, place, support, and embed teachers within specific communities that meet the needs of those communities. So if we're working with Baltimore City Public Schools, it means working very closely with their human capital department to understand what are the vacancies they have? What are they projecting? That way we can recruit specifically to bring in what we call residents, which our folks do a full year teaching residency before they become teachers of record, but really thinking about their human capital needs to inform our preparation work. So the tethering of those two pieces, which I think is really, really important, um, speaks to something that's not typically done in education, where there is a, a chasm where teachers typically might be trained in sort of, you know, the traditional higher ed, maybe bubble, if you will, do a student teaching in a very uniquely suburban area, maybe Bethesda, but then go teach in Ward 7 in DC. And that's a vastly different environment. In terms of, as we think about, you know, the uh, the cultural diversity, um, again, for urban teachers in our approach, and, and we were born out of Teach for America, our founder was a Teach for America alum, which is the recognition that to serve a community, you need to be a part of the community. You need to be embedded in the community. So whether that's Haitian American students in Miami-Dade, whether that's African American students in West Baltimore, making sure that the training and support goes on within those communities in a way that's intentional. And I'm gonna come back to that word, Mark, intentionality as we discuss this, because I think a lot of the impediments that that we speak to um, can be overcome. And you need to actually put effort and be intentional about what you're trying to do. Um, Sometimes it takes more time, money, and resources, but our kids deserve it. So, Kira, I I know you're nodding your head wanting to jump in and obviously a great deal of experience here. Oh, just like I'm I'm agreeing emphatically about the the choice of your word intentional, right? I mean, we the amount of of care that that is necessary um, 
to, to be put into thinking about how we train and support teachers um, to be successful in, in various settings. And, and just frankly, the amount of time and energy that's necessary to put into thinking about how to div- just build a diverse pipeline, right? I mean, at this point, more than half of Teach for America's pipeline reflects the backgrounds of students that we serve across a variety of communities. And, and that, that we think is an incredible part of the intentionality that, that Pete sp- is speaking about. So one of the uh, questions, and we're going to uh, we're going to run a second poll. We just ran a ran a poll, and we what was interesting is that um, when we asked about teacher performance, um, the first three questions are really about if you think about a bell curve, right? With with sort of the uh, excellent, um, and then sort of really good, and then uh, fair people. If you look at if you look at that. Basically, uh, 90% of the respondents that gave an answer uh, felt that teachers were on that side of the curve. Public school teachers were on that side of the curve. But we're going to ask another uh, series of questions, which is really about where there are teacher shortages. Where there are teacher shortages, what are the cause for that? We're going to kick that off uh, right now. So let's talk about the solution to those to those uh, spot shortages, which, uh, Kate, you basically point out they're spot shortages. It might be shortages of a particular skill set or in particular uh, regions of the country, but it's not a generic shortage, right? Yeah, the distinction is really important because the solution is different. Um, right. you know, as much as Pete Shulman or Teach for America can recruit to serve uh, positions which are in shortages, they're not going to keep those teachers unless the, if they're marketable elsewhere. So we can't get science and math teachers in this country because we ref- refuse to acknowledge the market reality that we have to pay more for them. And there's a lot of resistance to that. Right. So, so what are the solutions, Kira? I'm going to go to you first and then uh, Peter go, going to go to you after, after Kate's uh, I'm I'm having problems with my lighting here, so sorry about uh, becoming dark every once in a while. Um, What are the uh, solutions, Kira, that that you would see to address some of these spot shortages to create a much more rational um, system of of distributing teachers in a way that is fair to all the the kids? Because it shouldn't really matter where in the United States, if somebody lives in New Orleans, or somebody yeah. who's in rural Louisiana, shouldn't shouldn't a child get the same access to education? They absolutely should. And I'm sitting here looking at your poll and I'm thinking um, all of these on a given day actually are powerful <laughs> barriers or impediments to, to sort of solving this in lots of our communities, because the truth is what we need is a comprehensive approach to solutioning, right? It's not a silver bullet. It's not just one of these variables. You know, if we, if we were to think back about you know, think back to, to even over a decade ago when we were rebuilding um, New Orleans education system, right? When teaching um, was clearly going to play such an integral role um, to, to sort of produ- producing, um, you know, a, a different quality of education across the city. Essentially, we, we did recruitment. We had a national narrative that we were able to, to, to leverage and, and be a part of. Um, we had national partnerships that supported us in telling that story because so much of it is making sure that, that people who are deciding to go into the profession understand where the need is going to be greatest. And, and even in places like New Orleans, a decade later, where the need is still significant, more than a decade later, like the narrative is what we're still grappling with to figure out how to tell so that we can attract um, the, the, the force of teachers that we actually need. And, and so many other communities need that kind of coordinated approach to storytelling so that people actually know where to go um, and why they should be there. So one solution is to inform people, um, you know, we just completed this second poll and uh, the overwhelming uh, response is we're not paying people enough. Is this a market driven uh, problem with a market driven solution where you pay people based on the value of that particular skill set, whether it's multilingualism? or math and science or whatever, uh, you know, life isn't fair. There are certain skills that are more in demand um, and they get, they get compensated more. Peter, uh, do you do something like that? Or is that yeah, or is so, really just time and service? So, so right. So you think we, we, we typically differentiate by, um, you know, 
time in the, in, the, in the profession as you move right. along a salary guide, as well as potentially bubble steps through master's degrees and, and, and other uh, other attainment. So there is some there is some differentiation. But when you think about the market driven approach, I do gravitate towards where Kate was going. Compensation has to be part of this, right? We we can't think about in any industry where. Uh, where teachers, you know, broadly across from phys ed to physics are recruited, trained, and placed in the same way. They're compensated and developed in the same way. And then we have this teachers leaving every three, four years hole in the bucket that we try and fill. It's just nonsensical. So as we think about that differentiation and, you know, the federal and state governments have gone some degree of this when we think about um, loan forgiveness and, and, and aid that comes in specifically to teach in certain subject areas and certain in, in certain environments. But it's certainly not enough because what we've seen is a little bit of rinse and repeat. Right. And, and you know, as we think about the evolution and the, the genesis of TFA, Teach for America, and even more recently, urban teachers, um, we wouldn't exist or need to exist, this problem was being solved by the traditional mechanisms, both in terms of how teachers are being prepared, and then how do we actually treat them as a labor force? Well, is it, uh, isn't the public school system in certain respects being attacked due to its own inability to resolve these issues using uh, certain tools? I mean, it looks to me like charter schools, independent schools, and so on and so forth, have uh, become ascendant in many respects because the public school system across the country um, has not been able or has barred itself from from grappling um, with, you know, by applying certain solutions. And so, in a sense, there's an attack that's based on an inability to resolve some of the issues that, that you're raising, Kate. It isn't isn't that what's going on? Oh well, certainly charter schools and and Teach for America would never have gotten started if not for large scale dissatisfaction for uh, the traditional status quo or how we were preparing teachers and how we were educating kids. There's there's no question of that. The demand for charters has skyrocketed because just because of so much dissatisfaction. But I, I do want to pivot back to this point about. Uh, Pay. Pay is definitely has got to definitely be part of the solution because there is no field in which uh, we don't apply those market rules. But um, we are always going to have a hard time getting a physics teacher in schools these days because we can't begin to fathom competing with what Google pays for a physics. Right. Um, so we do have to look to other solutions. And I think that COVID has actually been a healthy injection of, uh, of trying new possibilities. So uh, we do need to spread the spread the influence of one physics teacher across more than one school to many schools. And that can be done. We now have the technology and everybody's used to it and we can do it. So I do think there are some creative ways to tackling some of these problems. But my, you know, the more fundamental issue is that in the United States, we routinely uh, for decades now have produced twice as many elementary teachers as are needed in the by school districts. Nobody does anything about that. Um, teacher prep says it's not our job to tell people they can't teach first grade. That's, you know, we're not going to do that. And states don't tell higher ed that if they want to keep licensing their teachers, you want to keep preparing teachers for a license, they have to reduce. Nobody's willing to make the hard steps. But imagine if you were an elementary, you wanted to teach first grade, but someone said, you know what, you can get $5,000 more if you're willing to teach special ed in first grade. Well, that might change a lot of people's minds. So money is absolutely part of the solution, but it's also being a little bit realistic about how we can spend that money. So I love the solutions that, that we're, coming, we're, we're coming to. First, there is this idea of, of sharing on a, on a regional and national basis data about supply and demand, of basically creating an information clearinghouse on a national basis, not dependent on the, on the federal government, but doing it as, as a, 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 an initiative. And that can work within a state, within a region, a collection of states, um, as you're doing, uh, Kira, or, or it, could be, it could be within a city. Uh, it could also be across the country. But data is absolutely important. The second piece 
is the whole idea of looking at this as as micro imbalances, not a national imbalance, but a micro imbalance, which was, uh, Kate, your your biggest uh, initial point. And then there's this whole issue of market based solutions, whether we're talking about allowing uh, compensation to follow demand and loosen that up a little bit and provide uh, some incentives for uh, people who teach disabled kids or, or are teaching in rural school districts or a market based solution of using um, uh, technology to uh, allow uh, teachers who are concentrated in a particular geography to teach uh, classes outside of that geography. I mean, I, I think we've got a whole set of actionable uh, elements. So as we as we move toward the uh, toward the end of our time here, let's go around uh, the room. I'm going to start with you, Peter, and then I'm going to end up with with you, Kira. We'll go, uh, Kate. You'll be in the middle, and I'll I'll uh, mention the results of our last poll uh, through this. Uh, Peter, how can you take? these and other solutions and make them actionable within the context of your operations? How, how does that function? And what are your biggest initiatives today? Yeah, so broad question. Um, uh, so I, I, let me just bookend the conversation we've been having because I think my answer will speak hopefully a little bit to both. We've been talking a lot about supply and demand, right? Equally elusive is this idea of quality and effectiveness data. And as we think about the two, it's not just about sort of getting a warm body in a physics role in a certain school district, right? And, you know, the two have to, to, to come together. So from the standpoint of urban teachers, you know, I, I think there, there's, 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 there's a couple pieces here. Um, first is I don't only believe it's the market, Mark. I believe it's the market and there is a role for government here, right? And I'll give an example of that. If I were you know, authoritarian in charge or what have you, I might say that every teacher should be certified in special education as well. As we think about 15% of students in this country that have an IEP and almost the impossibility of a teacher teaching their full career, not being in front of a, uh, a student uh, that has special needs, as well as the, just the quality it takes to be a teacher that can differentiate instruction. So at Urban Teachers, actually something we actually, I'm not just talking to talk, we actually require every one of our teachers to come through to get dual certified. So as we think about this, I don't have the answer for, for the, the broader elements of this. There are collective bargaining at play, which is both national and hyperlocal. We have uh, we have both federal, state, and local policy to, to wrestle with as a state policymaker. I, uh, I can speak to sort of one corner of that work. Um, my sense around this is that we need to um, bridge the gap, as I mentioned before, between how and where teachers are prepared and the realities of the schools and classrooms where they, where they will work. And um, I think within this, um, there's time, money, resources that this cost to do well. Urban Teacher is an expensive program. We're a long program. It's four years. And the way that the market plays in, Mark, is that when we work with school districts who, frankly, have opportunity costs to spend their dollars in different ways, whether they want professional development, whether they want a longer school day, whether they want to add another extracurricular activity, we need to make the impassioned plea to them and say, look at the data, look at the research of what a great teacher can do. And we do live in a world, Mark and, and Kate and, and Karen, I'm sure you, you, um, you, you, you hear this as well. There's still a faction out there that believes we can either teacher-proof things, just get the right you know, high quality curriculum in and it'll teach itself. There's a faction out there we can disintermediate teachers and just give every kid an iPad and, and you know, computer adaptive learning to solve that. Um, I think that COVID's proven some of that to be wrong in terms of, you know, parents saying, seeing the need of the importance of teachers, but really being able to continue to sell the importance of teachers. I know that sounds silly that we have to still do that in this day and age, why teachers are important, what the research says, what the research says about diverse teachers, what the research says about dual certified teachers, and then appealing to school district and saying, as you think about this finite set of resources that you have to spend here's why you should invest in teacher prep and development in the front end. So, so it's really, I mean, your focus is really on, on the teacher as a teacher and the professional skills, competencies, attributes um, of a teacher to ensure uh, both quality and, and the, that the correct teacher. I, available I, to that's right. I mean, Mark, just to put it out there, the greatest in-school factor that influences students' academic performance is the quality of the teacher in the classroom. 
That's been proven time and time again by research, as well as anyone who's ever spent time in K-12 or even higher ed. You know, the importance of what a great teacher can do does not have to be a, uh, you know, a research study alone. We've all lived it. And Kate, what is your what is your answer? What is your biggest initiative to improve the situation? And and you did talk about this this whole data uh, issue, which I thought was just fascinating. Yeah, it's it's intimidating, but um, it's so it's so it, we will not improve teacher quality in this country until we address um, the problem of uh, teacher shortage being declared on the basis of a few newspaper stories. Um, all anyone has to do is say national teacher shortage, and we see a lot of progress that we've made to improve quality teachers in the United States unravel. States are getting rid of testing requirements to make sure teachers actually know anything about the subject they're going to have to teach, simply because they're worried about a teacher shortage. Um, so we abs- so we're determined to start piloting this work in the next few years and really build it out, but it's, it's, it's not, it's not easy given, given how teachers move around. I mean, I think that, that what needs to be done in this, in this case is get a consortium of nonprofits together who each of them throughout the entire 50 states um, can have access to that data, agree on a standard and just collect that. Um, it shouldn't be that difficult. No, it's it is something that could be done <laughs> done uh, fairly quickly, and the infrastructure should is pretty much in place. It's it's amazing as I go around how knowledgeable people are about their regions. Kira, what is your? We're gonna we're gonna wind up with you, um, and and I'd like to thank everybody for um, for participating in our polls and in participating in the discussion. Kira, what is your uh, major initiative to create out of this discussion uh, some action? So, you know, I'll just build on on what's been shared already and add that, look, we T- Teach for America fundamentally is a leadership development organization, right? And we believe teaching is a profound act of leadership, right? And that beginning, you know, in the classroom and having a direct impact on students is the is the is a, the critical, most critical impact you can have on students. And you, you develop a set of insights that are integral for um, you to continue to have a great impact over the course of your career on, on the lives of children at scale. And I think that, um, and I think the, I can't stress enough the importance of leadership development in this conversation, right? Like teachers want to be invested in, not just in terms of what they're teaching this year in the classroom, but, but know that they can grow in this profession and that they actually will be supported and the conditions will be um, strong around them to do that. And so prioritizing the development of our teachers and the capacity building of our teachers and the conditions around them will be an integral part of, of what will lead to success. And in an organization like Teach for America, where we can leverage the scale and diversity of our, of our organization to be in over 50 regions and, and be able to sort of learn what, what works in a variety of contexts, despite diversity of context, um, enables us to better understand what it takes to develop teachers in those settings and, and support them. And it seems to me that every teacher who is who I've ever met in, in my life has been in it to impact students. So uh, providing more information, um, allowing a little bit of flexibility uh, so that uh, supply and demand can can be rationally orchestrated, that skills are improved on a continual basis, that people can make a rational living. Uh, it, it, it seems that it's all good. We need to get out of our way and try and be a little bit, a bit creative. Kira Orange-Jones, Executive Director for Teach for America out of Louisiana. Peter Schulman, CEO of Urban Teachers in Baltimore, Maryland, serving DC, Dallas, and now Philadelphia. And Kate Walsh, President of the Washington DC based National Council on Teacher Quality. Thank you all for sharing your insights on this. And, and, and this is a deep discussion, right? This is a little wonky uh, and intentionally so. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Thank your boards. Thank your staffs. Thank your donors. Thank your supporters. And thank your teachers for helping us become a better country. Have a great day, all. Everyone stay safe.